Good morning. morning. Good to see you all here today. Good to be with brothers and sisters in the house of the Lord. We'll be talking about the house of the Lord uh, some more today. (laughs) Uh, Ezra, book of Ezra, let's just open with a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help each one of our hearts to be as open and listening as Ezra and Nehemiah and Joshua and Zerubbabel were. Lord, may we be as just as receptive today as they were in their day um, to discern your will, to know your word, and to be uh, zealous to follow after it. Uh, we just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be uh, continuing in our series here today on this uh, time period, which is... Um, I'm just kind of uh, subtitling here the restoration of Jerusalem. This is the time after the 70 years of exile to Babylon, which uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, began uh, as he destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the houses, the walls, the temple, everything was completely torn down um, and destroyed. Uh, The people were removed from the land of Judah and Israel and brought to captivity in Babylon and various other provinces as well. And so we've been reading about um, uh, Ezra and uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua and Haggai and Zechariah in the last few weeks. And we've we've been kind of focusing here on the time period where uh, they, uh, just after the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia, um, at the end of the 70 years, which, which Daniel had prayed about, Daniel had discovered as he was reading in the scroll of Jeremiah uh, uh, that 70 years were decreed and, and that uh, Jerusalem, uh, the, the Jews would be gathered back to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. As Cyrus made a decree that all who may return uh, to, uh, would want to return to Judah, Judah may do so and rebuild Jerusalem, the temple, and its uh, walls. And so, um, in any case, last, uh, last couple of weeks, we've been looking at some of the prophecies and events in the books of Haggai and Zechariah. They were the prophets who were encouraging uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the remnant, the, the men who'd return, and women and children, um, to continue the building. And you remember that they had begun under Cyrus, but then... Uh, uh, we understand that Cyrus's reign only reigned just a few years after his original proclamation. And then there was another uh, king uh, in, of Persia, and uh, the enemies of the Jews had written a letter to that king, and he had responded and told them to stop, stop the work. And, and for a while it was stopped, it says, until the second year of King Darius, the next king. And... Um, and then, uh, through the prophecy of Haggai and Zechariah, without the order of the king, they simply began to rebuild and to work on the temple um, by God's command, not by the king's command. And, um, and we had also uh, read there where then they had said, well, we want to take your names, right? We're going to report you. And they had sent another letter then back to, um, to Darius now saying, hey, this work is going on. Do you know what's going on? This rebellious city is being rebuilt. And, uh, and give us an answer now. Um, is this, should this be happening? And so um, at the, uh, actually at the, end of, at the end of this letter, uh, we read in Ezra chapter 5, uh, the, the very last line of, of this letter, this is now a second letter. There was a first letter to the king after Cyrus, uh, requesting that this work should be stopped. And the answer from, from, from that king, um, Artaxerxes, was to stop the work. Now we've got new King Darius and another, a second letter now to him saying, hey, you know what's going on? And um, in Ezra chapter 5 and verse 17, this is the last uh, words of this second letter to a second king. Uh, which is, again, this letter was written from the enemies of the Jews who did not want to see the temple uh, finished. Um, and, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm just going to read just a couple of things in Ezra chapter 5, 8. Uh, they said to Darius the king, let it be known to the king uh, that the house 
of the great God, which is being built with huge stones and beams, are, are being laid in its walls, and the work is going on with great care and is succeeding in their hands. So in other words, the, the work, this is what we've read now, Joshua and Zerubbabel had begun the work. And uh, of course, we read in, in uh, uh, Zechariah how, uh, you know, the, the angel had appeared and said, Zerubbabel, your hands have begun this work and your hands are going to fit it. So here, they're now reporting to King Darius, look, this work is go it's being completed. If you don't stop it, you know, they're going to finish it. Anyway, the last words um, of this letter, Ezra 5, 17, says this. Now, if it, if it please the king, let a search be conducted in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon. And if it be that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to rebuild this house of God at Jerusalem, then, and let the king send us his decision concerning this matter. So one of the things that, that we know from uh, Daniel uh, that by the law of the, of the Medes and the Persians, right, whatever, whatever command the king had, uh, had made couldn't be changed. Remember, uh, uh, different King Darius had wanted to save Daniel from being thrown into the, the lion's den, but, the, but his uh, counselor said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you said anyone who prays to anyone or asks a, makes a request of anyone other than you, O king, has to be thrown into the lion's den and, and again, that different King Darius was so sad because he couldn't change, he had made the law, couldn't change it. In any case, um, so that's part of their uh, uh, request here. They're saying, hey, was it ever really decreed? We don't, we don't know, we don't believe it, and you should uh, check this out um, to this uh, other King Darius here. And so, um, uh, and I should say this too. Uh, we think that part of the issue here was that the uh, the second king, uh, part of this strategy, however, of the kings of Persia could could be or would be, well, if you destroyed all the records of such a command and no one could find it, was it really so? So they're saying you need to search around to see was this was this ever done? And it's very possible that this king before it who had stopped it had just destroyed many of these records um, from the past. And so in Ezra chapter six and verse one, we read this. Then King Darius issued a decree and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And in Ekbatana, uh, in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found and there was written in it as follows. Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers, and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Also let the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be returned and brought to their places in the, in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. So they had to make a search, and, and it's very possible that this other king had destroyed a lot of records, but they found it in one place, in this certain fortress in the city of Ekbata, not even apparently in necessarily Babylon proper, but they did, they found, they did find a record of it. Here it was, this decree of Cyrus really had been done. Um, and so uh, King Darius did indeed find the decree of Cyrus. And then uh, he goes on in verse six. So the first, in, in verse one, it says that Darius issued the decree. Now that decree was to go search for this record as had been requested, right? So go and search, go search all the archives and let's see, is this really true? Did, did Cyrus really decree uh, that the Jews should rebuild this temple. And then in verse six now, after having found the scroll and this decree as the Jews had claimed that there had existed and the enemies of the Jews had doubted and said, no, we don't think that was so. Uh, verse six, uh, King Darius continues on. He says, now therefore Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river and Shethar Bozani and your colleagues, the officials of the provinces, beyond the river, and those were the guys who had originally requested of him this answer. He says, keep away from there. Leave this work 
on the house of God alone. And let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree concerning what you are to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river, and that without delay. Whatever is needed, both young bulls, rams, and lambs for a burnt offering to the God of heaven, and wheat, and salt, and wine, and anointing oil, as the priests in Jerusalem request, it is to be given to them daily without fail that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. <laughs> and I issue a decree that any man who violates this edict, a timber shall be drawn from his house and he shall be impaled on it and his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overflow overthrow any king or people who attempts to change it so as to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued this decree. Let it be carried out with all diligence. So, again, we got letters going back and forth to Persia from Jerusalem and the province beyond the river, and there's all this argument. And finally, we've got an amazing answer from King Darius. Uh, and again, this is uh, the king here that, uh, from which uh, Ezra, Joshua, and Zerubbabel, Haggai, and Zechariah had all referred to uh, as the word of the Lord was coming in his day. And then we continue reading on the story here in, in uh, verse 13. It says, Then Tachai, the governor of the province beyond the riv river, and Shethar Bozani and their colleagues carried out the decree with all diligence, just as Darius had sent. And all the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, and they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel. That's first and foremost, right? <laughs> Ezra's recognizing here. Why are we re rebuilding this house? Are we doing it because Cyrus said so? Are we doing this because Darius said so? No, we're doing this because God said so. Uh, he says uh, again here in verse 14, so they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. This temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Okay, so at this point now, uh, there's... Uh, uh, some interesting historical and uh, historical, uh, yeah, discrepancies or arguments that come into play here. So, so first of all, in this verse that we just read, uh, we see the command of God, the God of Israel, the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and then we have a third character potentially uh, introduced here, Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now, this is interesting, and... Um, depends a lot upon your timing and understanding and, and how these uh, guys come into play. And um, so the question is, um, who is this, who is this Artaxerxes that's being mentioned here in verse 14, the, according to the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes? But so far we seem to only have, have two decrees. Now, here's one of the clues and Dave, you have to skip ahead in the, in the verses here because we're going to jump to Ezra 4 and verse, chapter 4 and verse 4. So let's go back in time. Uh, in Ezra 4.4, 4, uh, as a review, it says, The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. They frightened them from building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So again, this is going back to when they had first begun the work, right? And if you remember also, uh, the first request from their enemies was, hey, let us, we want to help you rebuild. Remember that? And the Jews then, knowing 
the, the deceitful motives of those who wanted to help, right? You know, sometimes helpers are not always helpful. <laughs> uh, knowing the deceitful motives of them, they said, no, you have, you have no place for us. God has commanded us to rebuild. You have no place helping us to rebuild. And then they began hiring the counselors against them. Um, anyway, so, and then it says in verse 6 of Ezra chapter 4, now in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. This was the first letter which we had just been referring to. And then in verse 7, and in the days of Artaxerxes, Bislam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of his colleagues wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the text of the letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. So now here we've got another Artaxerxes, apparently, or maybe, uh, certainly, this Artaxerxes in Ezra 4, verse 7, was the one who stopped the work. He wrote the letter back and said, yes, stop them. And remember, they came with force of arms and they had stopped the work. Also, what's interesting here in verse 6, it says in the reign of Ahasuerus, they wrote an accusation. And then in verse 7, the very next sentence, it says, and in the days of Artaxerxes, they wrote and the text of the letter was thus and so. And so what we're seeing here, I believe, is... Um, that the kings of Persia had different titles and different names. I think certainly in Ezra chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, the Ahasuerus and the Artaxerxes weren't two different kings. It's referring to him, referring to the same king that they're writing to. Um, and uh, I think part of the understanding here is that the title, that the, the name Artaxerxes is more of a title than a name, like Pharaoh. You've got Pharaoh Nico, Pharaoh this, Pharaoh that, Pharaoh the other thing. Also could be similar to the Caesars of Rome. You had Caesar this, Caesar that, Caesar the other, right? Um, and so the term Artaxerxes, and so when he says in verse uh, Ezra 4, 6 about Hasuerus and Artaxerxes, he's talking about his name and his title. Talking about the same guy. Not two different kings in Ezra chapter 4. And uh, certainly then, uh, so I think that's uh, establishing part of this um, a potential uh, answer to the question, who's the Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes in um, Ezra chapter uh, 6? And, uh, and, and there is a, a simple, and I should, should mention at this point here, that as I've studied this in the past and, and restudying this again, um, and because there's a lot of different names uh, thrown around here, um, I found a, a great article, what I considered to be a great article, by, uh, written by David Austin. It was published in the Journal of Creation in August 2008. Uh, in fact, you can still find the article on the Creation Ministries International website talking about uh, how, you know, and part of what the Creation Ministries is do, does is... Um, has to argue against the, the secular, sometimes timelines of these kings and, and civilizations and their time versus the biblical, what's the biblical account say? And so this article was written, the title of the article is Darius's Artaxerxes. <laughs> That's the, so, and I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a great, and, and I received a lot of insight from reading this article for the arguments that, and what he says is that the, the simplest way to understand this um, in Ezra chapter 6 and uh, verse 14, when he says, uh, according to the decree of Cyrus, Darius, instead of and, that interjection can be translated even Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So not referring to a third king, but saying Darius, even Artaxerxes, in other words, his name and his title in the same sentence. And that, uh, I think, again, if you go back to uh, Ezra 4, I think Hasuerus and his part of Xerxes in those two, same thing. We talk about his name and his title. And here again, certainly that's not the same art of Xerxes in, uh, for sure in Ezra 4 and Ezra 6. Um, and so with that, um, uh, with that being said, we, I want us to continue reading here in Ezra 6 and verse 16. Uh, it says here that the son, and so the sons of Israel and the priests and the Levites and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered for the dedication of the temple, this temple of God, 100 bulls and 200 rams 
400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, uh, co corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. Verse 18, then they appointed the priests and their divisions and the Levites in their order for the service of God in Jerusalem, just as it is written in the book of Moses. And the exiles observed the Passover on the 14th of the first month, for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together, and all of them were pure, and they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, both for their brothers and the priests and for themselves. And the sons of Israel who returned from the exile and all those who had separated themselves from the impurity of the nations of the land to join them to seek the Lord of God of Israel, and they ate the Passover. Uh, verse 22, and they observed the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had caused them to rejoice and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And so, um, and so that was the rest of uh, Ezra chapter 6. And, uh, and particularly I want us to uh, pay attention to something else here at this, this very last verse. Uh, it says, as they observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, they rejoiced that God had turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And I also want you to note here in this verse 14, it calls him the king of Assyria, right? And just uh, a few verses up in verse 14, it says uh, king of Persia. Again, so, so we're seeing here there's a lot of different names. You, you got the Persian name for things. You got the Israel name for things. They considered him the king of Assyria. He called himself the king of Persia. It's okay. It's two different languages. It's two different cultures. It's just how they refer to it. It's not a contradiction. And again, this is he's not talking about some other king of Assyria now. There's, so far, there's been no reference to any king of Assyria in, in the book of Ezra, right? It's kings of Persia, kings of Persia, kings of Persia. But here we have this reference to, he just says, had turned the heart of the king of Assyria Toward them, right? So, so the point is, we've got different titles, different names, Jewish names, Persian names, Artaxerxes, Darius, they, they're using different names, but a lot of these are interchangeable. And, um, and then in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 1, we read this. Now, after these things, in the reign of, of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah. And then it goes through and it gives the, um, the genealogy of Ezra. And, and in, in the beginning here now in chapter 7, we kind of get Ezra's life story. So this is the book of Ezra. It was written by Ezra. But, but at this point, he, he maybe hasn't been personally in the story. But right here in chapter 7, uh, we're going get, to get Ezra's uh, personal story and his, uh, his interaction amongst all these events. And so, um, uh, if you, in, in a lot of your Bible notes, if you've got notes in your Bibles or footnotes, or if you just go look them up on the internet or whatever you want to do, a lot of Bible notes and scholars will tell you that there is an 80-year gap between uh, Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7, and it's kind of based on this title here in verse 1, uh, the, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And... Um, uh, in a couple verses down, uh, in Ezra chapter 7 and verse um, 6, uh, after Ezra's genealogy, we read this. It says, this Ezra, the one who had just given his genealogy here, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, which the God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all he requested because the hand of his God was upon him. Now, that statement, the king granted him all that he requested. Well, what had he, he requested? We don't know yet. It's actually, he's going to follow, he's going to give us that part of the story shortly. So Ezra had made a request to the king here. And um, in verse 7 says, Some of the sons of Israel and some of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the temple servants went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Okay, so... Uh, seventh year of King Artaxerxes here, uh, Ezra's leading a group to go to Jerusalem. And we're going to hear the story right shortly in the, in the verses that follow. Um, 
So I think that this is, uh, timing-wise, this is in response to finishing the temple in the sixth year of King Darius. Now he's talking about the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, right? And if that interjection means even in, uh, in Ezra 6.14, as his Cyrus, Darius, even Artaxerxes, that makes perfect sense then. He switches names kind of midstream here, um, but he's talking about the, the sixth year of King Darius is the seventh year of Artaxerxes. That's the same king. Darius is Artaxerxes. It's the next year. Uh, Ezra was in Babylon still. He was not one of the first to travel back with uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel. Uh, but now Ezra, a scribe, skilled in the law of God, who's got a, a heart to, to understand and to learn, uh, here then goes to uh, King Artaxerxes, makes a request, and, um, and returns with uh, Levite singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants that go to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. I believe this is in response to the completion of the temple. Now that the temple's complete, it has to have service. We need gatekeepers and all these people. And, and, and in fact, uh, we're not going to read this exact part, but as they're preparing to leave, Ezra feels like they don't have enough people to, to go back. And so he um, says here that he... Um, I'll just read part of that here. Um, uh, in, in Ezra 8 and 15, he says, Now we assembled at the river that runs to Ahava, where we camped for three days. And when I observed the people and the priests, I didn't find any Levites there, right? And so in verse 16, he says, I sent for Eliezer and Ariel and Shemaiah. So he sends more. He says, we don't have enough. We're making this big trip, right? From, from Babylon back to Jerusalem. I believe in, in response to the fact that the temple's now complete. We've got we've, we've to do the work, the service, right? He says, we don't have enough. So he, he sends for them for these other guys and they join uh, the group in Ezra app, chapter eight that's going to be uh, returning. Again, I don't, I don't think, I don't believe in the 80 year gap theory, okay? That's, let's just say that. And maybe you do and that's okay and that's fine and probably maybe you've never heard of it. And then, you know, until I studied it, I never heard of it either. So <laughs> I hope if you haven't heard of it, don't feel bad. That's okay. I haven't heard of it either. <clears throat> but to, to me, the, the 80 year gap doesn't, doesn't make sense. And it does make sense that <clears throat> Darius is Artaxerxes. We're talking about the same king. And Ezra is immediately returning back to Jerusalem in response to the completion of the house. He's bringing uh, gatekeepers and Levites and temple servants back because the house needs to, to be run properly. Um, and uh, if we go back then to Ezra chapter 7, in verse 8, it says, He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first month he began to go up from Babylon, and on the fifth month he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of his God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Okay, so, so basically at the beginning of chapter 7, Ezra, here we get the, sh the short story, the synopsis, <laughs> right there. He, uh, he had uh, received from the king uh, orders. He, he went from Babylon to Jerusalem. And then in verse 11, uh, he says, now this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra. So again, that was mentioned a couple, uh, a couple verses earlier. It says that the king... Uh, granted him all that he had requested. So here now is the, is the copy of the decree which Ezra carried back with him from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 11. Now this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe, of the law of God, of the God of heaven, perfect peace. So, so this is very interesting. This is um, a letter that Ezra is carrying with him. It's, it's showing authority, but the letter is, is a, per, a, a personal letter. I mean, it's from Artaxerxes to Ezra. To Ezra. Um, 
And he calls him here, again, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven. Um, again, if you remember back to the, the, the first letter, which Darius had, um, had given, just uh, I believe just a couple years earlier, he also called him the God of heaven. Right? So I think we're seeing similarities because, again, it's the same author, not two different kings and not 80 years apart, but the same uh, author. In any case, um, he says here, uh, <clears throat> this letter is to Ezra, uh, Artaxerxes, king of kings, verse 12, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace. And now I have issued a decree that any of the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my kingdom who are willing to go to Jerusalem may go with you. So uh, similar to Cyrus now, Darius is, is issuing another decree, sending a, a second group back. I, again, I believe in response to the fact that the temple has now been completed. But the work is not done, right? We know Nehemiah is going to come along and he's going to help him rebuild the walls here. Um, <clears throat> but the temple also needs to be, and the service needs to be, uh, to be uh, done properly here. Um, he says, so all, anyone in my kingdom who's willing to go to Jerusalem may go with you. In other words, they are free to go with you. Um, again, this is a couple kings after King Cyrus, so people may have thought like, I don't know, you know, like, like where, where are you going, buddy? You know, where's your papers? Well, how come you're leaving? Well, now we have authority here by uh, Artaxerxes, I believe, Darius, um, to do this. Um, he says here in verse um, 14, uh, for as much as you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and to bring the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So once again, as, as Ezra has sought the counsel of the king, somehow he obtained a uh, an interview with the king and the king in response and they sent a free will offering now of gold and silver uh, back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> he says, uh, which in verse 15, he says, which we have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. Verse 16, along with the silver and gold uh, which you find in the whole province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests who offered willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. Again, I, I believe that this is absolutely in response to Zerubbabel and Joshua just completing the work, but now they need to adorn the house. They need to beautify it. They need to, um, <clears throat> to get it ready. Verse 17, he continues on. He says, with this money, therefore, you shall diligently buy bulls and rams and lambs with the grain offering and the drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 18, he continues, whatever seems good to you and to your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. Also the utensils which are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. The rest of the needs for the house of your God, for which you may have occasion to provide, provide, <clears throat> provide for it from the royal treasury. And so, again, they had also offered additional utensils. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had returned, um, or Cyrus had returned the utensils, but they needed more. Again, I believe all this is in response, not 80 years later, probably, not 80 years later, uh, but is in direct response to the finishing the, of the work. Now we've got to, to, to finish it, to, to make everything uh, work in properly. He continues on, <clears throat> verse 21. I, even I, King Artaxerxes, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the provinces beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, it shall be done diligently, even up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt as needed. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven so great. This is the great king Artaxerxes saying, you better do whatever is commanded by the God of heaven. Right? And by the way, what happened to all the Jewish kings that led up to the 
the desolation of, of Jerusalem, right? Where, where, were, where, where were their statements of this kind? How come they didn't have this type of response to the prophets and the priests, right? They weren't listening. We went over that last week, right? But guess what now? This king of Persia, he's listening. He's listening. He's believing. And he's not just believing. He's putting his actions behind his belief, isn't he? He sure is. He sure is. God said that he begged with the kings, right, and the people. I sent my prophets time after time, but what did you do? You despised them, right, and you killed them. Ezra's not being killed here. Ezra's being lifted up. Ezra's being supported. And this king of Persia is saying, yeah, whatever the God of heaven declares, and and you know, Ezra, because you're a scribe, and you've studied his law, and and I can tell, and you've got his, it says you've got his law in your hand, right? He says, you do this. You do this. Verse 23, whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of the God of heaven so that there will not be, this is so interesting, so that there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. What a wise king. What a wise king. He has come to believe that there is a God of heaven and that he, his house is in Jerusalem and it needs to be done, pro- and there needs to be sacrifices. And if there's not enough money from the, the poor, you know, slaves who returned, right? You provide it out of the treasury of all the governors beyond the river. It's just you do those sacrifices so there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. Whatever you need, For the sacrifices you do. He says in verse 24, and we inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the Nethanim, or the servants of the house of God. You cannot tax them because they need to be able to do this work. They need to be able to worship God properly and they need to do it on behalf of the king and his sons, so that wrath should not come against us. Again, this is, uh, was very similar to the, to the letter that we read about in the chapter prior um, when he said uh, in, the, in the previous letter, he said that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. That was Ezra 6.10. Right? So again, I... I think, to me, the evidence points that this is the same king. The same king that's writing this special letter to Ezra is the same one who wrote the letter in Ezra 6, commanding, get this house rebuilt. He's, he's worried about uh, his own life and the life of his sons, and that sacrifices be uh, made on their behalf. Uh, and, then, and then he continues on. We're not quite done. This is quite a lengthy letter from this Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Um, In verse 25, he says, continues on, he says, you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, right? He's recognizing that Ezra's uh, applying, he's he's got the law, he knows it, he's been studying it, he's wanting to apply it to his life. He says, you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, Appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, even all those who know the laws of your God, and that you may teach anyone who is ignorant of them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him strictly, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of goods or for imprisonment. Amazing letter from this king of Persia, right? Yeah. Uh, And then Ezra ends the chapter, verse 27. Ezra says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to adorn the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, 
And he has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. Thus I was strengthened according to the hand of the Lord my God upon me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go with me back to, Jer- back to Jerusalem, to adorn the house, to do the thing, to, to, to teach the people how they should do, right? I mean, the house of Israel, the house of the Lord's been destroyed for 70 plus years. Now it's rebuilt. We've got to restart, right? And so uh, this king sends Ezra to do so specifically, to, to be in charge, to, to, to get the sacrifices, you know, going properly and do all these things. Um, so a, a couple of other interesting things here. When we, when we look at some of these um, statements and, um, and how, again, how, how these characters are all playing together, Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and I'm just going to tell you right now, I think that Esther has a big part in this, even though she's not mentioned. Um, one of the, I believe one of the clues that we have here um, was, was all the way back in chapter uh, 6, and uh, verse seven, but Ezra six and verse seven, um, and 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 verse six, when um, when Darius sends the decree here, he he tells those governors to keep away from there. He says, "Leave the work on the house of God alone." He says, "Let the governor of the Jews and the elders and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house on it, on its site." And this was, again, this was the original confrontation that they had with the, with the rulers of this land here. They said, we want to help them. We want to be part of this. And the, the Jews said, no, you have no part in the building of the house of our God. You, you are not. You don't believe. You don't understand. You're not. It's not just the fact that they weren't Jews, but, but they weren't Jews in the heart, right? They weren't worshiping God. They just wanted to be a part. They wanted to have their hand in this for business purposes, other purposes, <laughs> stuff like that, right? And so, so all the way back in chapter six, how did the king, how did King Darius, all, all he had gotten was a letter that says, uh, we want you to search, was this, was, did Cyrus really issue a decree to rebuild the temple? And that was the question. It was nothing about, you know, leaving them alone, keeping away from there, and let the governor of the, and let them rebuild the house. That's the emphasis, I believe, in uh, Ezra uh, chapter 6 and verse 7. So I think, to me, that's a clue that, that Darius had an inside guy. Right? Now, it could be, maybe God just put that in his mind. Like, he didn't know why he was saying that. He just felt like saying that. Or, you know, he said it because God simply inspired him to say that. That could be the case, right? Could, could definitely be the case. God simply inspired him to speak those words. He didn't know why he was saying them. He didn't know the story. He didn't know the background. But it also could be that he did know the background. And that when the letter came, he had an advisor who said, hey, let me tell you the story here, King. This is what's been going on. And so that when Darius sends the letter, not only does he just simply give them the answer that, he's, that they're looking for, but, he's, but he tells them specifically for basically un, unspoken requests. I mean, that wasn't specifically requested in that, that letter. Um, and so, um, and so I think that that's a, a very possibly Esther and Mordecai. Now, there's some, some issues with the timing of the years that, uh, and I want to talk about Esther in a few weeks, um, so we'll get into some of those issues, but just rest assured, it's, it's not quite as clean as all that. <laughs> I wish it were. <laughs> I wish I could just lay out exactly how it is, um, but there's some discrepancies in the the timing and the dates in Esther and different uh, different books, and so just understand that that um, is definitely a challenge. Um, I, I do think again, though, one of the the answers to some of these challenges of the timing of, of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, t- to me, part of the answer is not having an eighty year gap in there. Uh, to me, these are events that are playing out; they're playing together, um, and, and Ezra is is is, is running by by the the prompting of the Holy Spirit, God himself say, look, you need to be you know, in charge here now in Jerusalem and helping all these reestablish what should they be doing now that the temple is um, rebuilt. 
And so, um, and so here we have here in verse 27, uh, Ezra's player, prayer, Ezra blessing uh, the Lord, the God of his fathers, who has uh, not only put, as he says, in the, in the king's heart, but he has extended loving kindness to me before all of his counselors and all of the king of Persia's mighty princes. Again, I think Mordecai has a, a big part to play in Esther in, in that very thing. Even, again, we, we have no idea why King Artaxerxes even gave him, um, uh, you know, met with him in the first place. Like, who are you? I'm a busy guy. You know? I'm the king of Persia. You're some Jewish slave from the captivity in Babylon. We're going to talk why. <laughs> Take up my time. Anyway, I think they're probably... It probably is some backstory. It, again, it could just be God just, he, he sent a request and, the, and God just put it in his heart and he did it. And that, that's a simple answer too. You know, so uh, again, a little uh, speculation here beyond um, what we have specifically in scripture for us. Nonetheless, I want to uh, read a little bit more in, um, in Ezra chapter eight. So, so we've already read in, in chapter seven, it says that they arrived in Jerusalem, right? But now we're actually going back. He's, he just gave us a letter now, which he's taking with him to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 8, he actually tells us the details of how they got there. All right, how they got there. So again, oftentimes in scripture, we like to see the events of chapter 8 take place after the events of chapter 7, but it's not really the case. The events of Ezra chapter 8 um, were, were taking place, if, if you really want to time it here, um, at the beginning of... Uh, chapter 7, when he says, uh, in the first month, uh, we began to go up to Babylon. In the fifth month, we arrived in Jerusalem. That was Ezra uh, 7 and verse 9. Uh, but here in chapter 8 is the story of, of that simple statement. Uh, we left in the first month, then we arrived in the fifth month. <laughs> Here's the story in Ezra chapter 8. And at the beginning of chapter 8, um, Again, Ezra goes uh, through a genealogy of the list of all those who were going back with him. And I also just uh, mentioned to you a couple of minutes ago here that um, when they had assembled in verse 15, Ezra 8, 15, he says, we assembled at the river that runs to Ahava and we camped there for three days. He says he observed the people and the priests, but he didn't find any Levites. So at the last minute that they're getting ready to go, he sends out uh, an SOS to some Levites that he knew. And he said, look, guys, we don't have enough. We, we're going back to Jerusalem. We need to reestablish the temple service, and we don't have Levites. And, um, and then uh, in verse 18, he says, according to, um, according to the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of insight of the sons of Mali, uh, the sons of Levi, of the sons of Israel. And then it, it talks about the men, uh, 220 uh, men then that, went back, joined the group at the last minute as they're getting ready to make this, this journey. And we're going to pick up the story then in Ezra 8 and verse 21. Ezra says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. So they're, again, they're getting ready to now make the journey. He's got the letter of the king in his hand. And what else does he have in his hand? All the gold and the silver and the utensils. He's taken a huge caravan of precious stuff back to adorn the temple. Right? right? He's got a lot of valuable stuff that they're now going to be carrying on a long trip, which we know is going to take about five months. He says he left in the first month. He got there in the fifth, fifth month. So whatever, four, four and a half, whatever. It's quite a journey. Quite a journey on foot with precious treasures going a long way over land. So he proclaims a fast here by the river of Ahava to seek a safe journey for us and our little ones and all our possessions. Primarily, he's talking about the possessions which the king and his counselors gave to adorn the temple. It's going to be embarrassing if they don't get there, right? Verse 22, this is such an amazing verse. Uh, you know, we all need to practice what we preach, right? doesn't matter whether you're the preacher or the son or the <laughs> who you are, right? We need to walk 
We need to walk the talk. We need to practice what we need to preach. We need to let our yes be yes and our no be no, right? And we need to apply the truth of Scripture. So let's see how Ezra did this. Verse 22. He says, For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way, because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably, favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. So Ezra had been preaching, right? How did he get this letter? How did he get the free will offerings? Why did he say, thank you, God, that all the king and his mighty counselors have uh, treated us favorably? Because he preached to the king of Persia. Listen, the God of heaven, his hand is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. That's what he preached. And as a result of his preaching, the king and his counselors said, okay. Okay, you know what? We believe that. So here's a letter. We're going to give you authority, and here's gifts. You go adorn this house, and, and you buy sheep and bulls, and you make sacrifices for the king and his sons, lest wrath come upon the king and his sons. This, is, this, is the, this was the message that Ezra preached. He said, because I preached that message, I was ashamed to ask for troops and horsemen to guard us along the way. practicing when he was preaching. It's a dangerous journey. He's got valuable possessions. He's going a long way. And with little ones, it's going to be a slow trip. He says, so he fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. And then it tells the story here. He weighs out uh, the silver and the gold into uh, the hands of uh, different men, verse 25, he says, I weighed out to them the silver, the gold, the utensils, and the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel present, present there had offered. Again, these are all the offerings now he's taken back from the king of Persia. And his he says he weighed them, he counted them out carefully, right? We're not going to have anything missing when we arrive home, nor are we going to have somebody shaving. <laughs> nor are we going to have somebody shaving the bowls down you gave me 12 bowls, and here's your 12 bowls, but they're a little lighter than they took the journey. So he weighs everything out into the hands of different ones. He says, you be in charge of this, you be in charge of that. We're weighing it now, and we're going to weigh it when we get to Jerusalem, just so you know. <laughs> in verse 28, Ezra says, I told these, these men, you are holy to the Lord, and the utensils are holy. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Who does this belong to? This is God's stuff. Now you take care of it. It's not yours. I'm putting it in your hand. But it's not yours. In verse 31, uh, we read here, it says, We journeyed from the river Ahava, on the 12th of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was over us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and the ambushes on the way. Thus we came to Jerusalem and remained there three days. Ezra practiced what he preached. Now, had the king simply offered, you know, but he didn't. He could have, the king could have offered a guard. And, and would it have been wrong for Ezra to take it? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, it's okay. And if Ezra had requested troops, would that have been a huge sin? I don't know. I mean, a lot of us would say, well, that wouldn't be wise. If you want to take the best care of God's stuff, you should request a guard with you. But all I'm telling you is, Ezra said, I believe in the hand of God. 
I've been telling everybody that his hand is with those who are with him and his hand is against those who are against him. And so he went without a guard. And he arrived safely. This is such a challenge for us, right? He says to the men, you are holy to the Lord. All of these utensils, utensils are holy. These are God's things, not your things, right? Do you remember what Jesus said when they tested him? They said, hey, is it legal to pay tax? Should we be paying taxes to Caesar? Jesus said, give me a denarius. He said, Who's, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin? He said, well, Caesar. Jesus said, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar. But give to God the things that are God's. Who's... Whose, whose likeness inscription is, you know, the coin had Caesar's likeness and inscription. Whose likeness and inscription is God's? That's us. We're made in his likeness. We're made with his, he says, his words on our heart. Even the Gentiles who've never heard the law, the, the law is written on their hearts. Again, Ezra is fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 14. He, he says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, when you see the conduct and the behavior of the survivors of this captivity, it will make your heart glad. And you will know that I did not do in vain all the things I've done against Jerusalem. When you see the behavior of Ezra and Nehemiah of Joshua and Zerubbabel and all these men who survived the captivity says, you will know I haven't done in vain what I did. I'm producing a people who are listening, who are willing to apply, walk the walk, talk the talk, practice what they preach. Just as these men, just as Ezra challenged these men, he says, you are holy to the Lord. All the stuff that you have is holy to the Lord. Hey, that applies to us. That applies. We're, we're in the likeness and inscription of God. We're his gift to God. What is God's? Listen to his words. Walk his way. And don't be ashamed to go out on a limb and obey God and do his way. He will be a strong, just like Ezra said, his hand is against those who are against. His hand is favorably disposed to all those who seek him with all their heart. May we do.